Hey guys, welcome to Hope It Helps. And my guest on the show today is Miss Lisa Brightwell. Lisa, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me, Khaled. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. So Lisa, I mean, you actually connected uh, a couple of months ago through a uh, mutual friend of ours, uh, Joe, who told me about the work you do and he spoke so highly of you and I've done my own research and I think you've worked at every big hotel chain there is uh, in, the, in the world by now. So, I, and I spoke to also Paula, who I know you've been on her podcast as well. So we talked about loyalty marketing, but for today, since you have more experience, I guess, in the hospitality side not necessarily maybe the loyalty side that's what i'd like to focus on today so just talk about your experience you know how is it working at all these different hotels what secrets can you give us consumers <laughs> that we don't know about um and just you know see uh take the conversation from there but before we get started lisa why don't you give all of us a little bit of background about yourself and we'll get started sure so obviously my name's lisa uh i have lived in the uae, UAE now for uh coming up to 17 years um, I feel like this is my my home now. There is nowhere else I'd rather live. So this is home. Um, I'm. I sound like I'm from the UK. I am from the UK. My mom is actually French. My grandmother was Spanish. My dad side. Uh, my, my my grandfather was Belgian. My dad is English, German, Norwegian, Irish. So I'm what you probably call a very uh, European mix. Um, my background, like you rightly say, is hospitality. My love and passion has always been hospitality. And I think over the years, um, that's kind of morphed into uh, a loyalty direction and how we can strategically help travel and hospitality brands to kind of uh, achieve their objectives. And that I've got my two loves together, if you like. I've got my hospitality love and then my love for, for loyalty and data together. So I think I'm quite lucky in what we do, what, what we do really. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Um, and I know you also um, now run your own consultancy and we're going to, uh, because I remember you told me uh, briefly about that story um, uh, last time we spoke about, I'm going to save that for a bit later. Um, I wanted to start with, so you said your passion is hospitality and that's what you like. So what, what drew you to the industry? Was that something that you always wanted to do? And what, I guess, makes this industry uh, unique compared to others? Yeah, I've always wanted to uh, work in travel. Um, specifically hotels has always been my passion and I think that started from when I was a really young age. Uh, I moved to America when I was nine and um, my parents had us stay in a hotel for a few months until they found us somewhere to live and it was like one of these very traditional American motels type and it was quite a long time ago when this is probably acceptable but my parents used to go out for dinner and they used to leave us with the reception um, staff in the hotel and okay. the chef uh, it's probably not allowed these days, but you know, <laughs> my age. Um, the this, this chef used to come out of the kitchen with a plate of cookies and, you know, um, um, we used to sit at the front desk and we kind of got involved, me and my brother, we used to play in the pool. Um, my parents were always kind of in the hotel, like somewhere, but we were really kind of, you know, um, living the hotel life and I really loved it. I absolutely loved the lady at front desk. She used to let me sit behind and like help when people check in and, and, and all the cookies and everything I used to get. So I really started my love for hotels then. Um, and then I, my first hotel job was actually with Marriott Group. And um, I was enjoying my job there, I had a fantastic role there. But I think what really kind of cemented me in the hospitality industry was actually um, the Marriott family. Um, I was really lucky to report into Steve Marriott. Um, unfortunately, he's no longer with us, but Steve Marriott was the, the kind of head of my department, if you like. And I will never forget this story. And it's something that I love telling people because it personifies for me what the hospitality industry really is at its core. Um, but I went to Bethesda in Washington where the Marriott head office is. And I was thinking I was like about, I don't know, 25, 20, 20 something. I was really nervous, you know, you're going to the head office of the company you work at. And then the team said to me, oh, you're going to meet Steve, Steve Marriott. I'm, 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 I'm in shock. I'm, oh, no, 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 I don't, I don't want to meet him, you know. Oh, gosh, no, I'm too scared, you know. And I was very intimidated by meeting one of the Marriotts. And um, so I go into his office and I sit down and he's a lovely guy. And he's like saying, hey, Lisa, tell me about yourself. And I was so nervous. I was just, I, I, I wasn't articulating myself very clearly. And he said to me, Lisa, tell me what you love about the United States. And the only thing I could think of to say was, I love cheese popcorn. <laughs> um, yeah, so 
<laughs> and then it came out my mouth and I was like, what am I saying? You know, because we didn't have cheese popcorn in England at the time. And, you know, it was like, what am I saying to Steve Marriott? I was mortified. Anyway, he was like, oh my God, yeah, I love it too. He made me feel really relaxed and really comfortable. And I walked out of the room, you know, head down, ashamed. I can't believe I messed up like that. Anyway, months passed later uh, and I had a knock on my door in the UK and it was a delivery guy. And the delivery guy had one of these trash cans, you know, these American metal trash cans that are about yeah. a meter or so high. Um, and inside there was a trash can, like decorated, full of cheese popcorn um, oh, wow. from Steve Marriott with a little Christmas note saying, I know you like it, happy Christmas or something. And what that meant to me was so much because not only as a young hospitality professional, I felt like I completely embarrassed myself in front of, the, of this guy. But he really taught me um, the true essence of what hospitality is. You know, he demonstrated the impact of what, you know, positive experience can happen by being at the top and driving that down, but also the emotional connection that people can have with people and with brands. And I really believed in everything that Marriott was doing because it came from the top. And I really believed in their desire and their want to drive this great customer experience for every guest that came into a Marriott hotel. And from then on, I just was kind of, completely embedded in the culture and just loved it and it, it was kind of like the cementing sorry, the cementing of my love if you like and it, it kind of came from him so i'm very um was very touched yeah that's an awesome story i love how he sent you you know the popcorn all those months later and you would have thought from your perspective like oh i messed up and then it's like yeah. oh, okay maybe maybe not maybe not um but something i i think that's a great story because what it makes me think about i'm not in the industry but it's about so hospitality sounds like it's about being thoughtful and, and kind of surprising your guests. Like in that story, for example, it's something, it's, he sent you some popcorn. It's not in the act itself isn't that huge, but the emotional significance behind it is what like really touched yeah. you. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I mean, it, it was, um, it really is about creating that emotional connection, like you say, it really connected to me. And I, and I tell that story a lot. And by telling that story, I'm sharing a little piece of Marriott with people. And by doing that, people are falling in love with the brand, they're creating that emotional connection. So it, it's it's one little event that was insignificant, probably to him and, and you know, the billions of colleagues he has has in the world. But that one little thing made such a difference to me in my, in my career, if you like. So yeah, it's a cute story. <laughs> yeah, no, that's I love it. It's, it's an awesome story. So that's You've worked at MR, you've worked at Jumeirah, you've worked at Maya, so you've worked at a lot of the large, largest hotel chains and brands in the world. Now, I'm, I would assume across the board, everyone's trying to develop or uh, create that emotional connection with their guests, but have you, what did, working at like different companies, did you f learn something new about how there's a different mindset maybe with like uh, MR compared to Jumeirah or Marriott, for example. Does it, is there something unique about each one? Does each one have a different way of, of looking, of looking at, you know, creating that emotional connection? Yeah, I think everybody has their different brand values, you know, and everyone um, um, kind of sits their brand on it and it props up the brand and it, and it, and it kind of filters through to the delivery. I mean, Jumeirah, um, has some great brand values and they kind of really embed that even into the logo you know the Jamira logo has this kind of flame which is three stripes those three stripes are three core core hallmarks that the colleagues must live and, and, and ride by you know you never say no to a guest you know you have to respect your colleagues so there's three I can't remember the fourth, third one now but the th the, those three um, uh, principles are kind of embedded through the, 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 the colleagues and all the way through to the customer experience. And every brand has slightly different because every brand is striving a different type of customer experience. Um, um, but it is interesting to see how the different companies do that in different ways. And obviously Marriott is a huge multinational company uh, and Jamira and MR are slightly smaller. So I had a different level of kind of connection um, with the brands for different reasons, because of their sizes, because of their, where they are in the world, uh, and, and the pillars that kind of uphold the brand philosophies. Yeah, uh, and I, th I think that's a great point you mentioned about how each brand has its own value. But this is something because it's something I think about when I think about hospitality. If I go on the website, if I go on their Instagram, I'm just talking from an aesthetic point of view. All these, all the brands that we just talked about have beautiful hotels and great amenities and so on. So in my mind, 
from a consumer's perspective, I'm like, okay, I'm like, how, how do you like, I guess, entice me to come to you rather than go to someone else? Because you both, the product is great across the board. And I am from, in my opinion, I think there's maybe a limited way of being creative because you guys are so similar and you have the, the product is pretty consistent across the board. So from, I guess, a marketing and innovation perspective, how do you, I guess, create that emotional connection with the customer? How do you stand out to make, you know, the guests come to my hotel, for example, rather than someone else's? So how, how do you kind of create that brand, if you like? And, and, yeah. and that that's the difficult part. And, and I think people see a hotel logo and think, oh, there's the brand. But oh my goodness, the, the visualization of the brand is the last thing that happens in the creation of a brand. You know, um, the brand needs to resonate with your audience. The brand, you need to understand who you're targeting and why. Um, and then you need to brown, build the brand from, you know, bottom up and the, and the, and the whole visualization piece sits on the top. Um, it's very important that the, the brand talks to the audience. It's very important that the brand creates um, values and pillars, a bit like we talked about before, and that kind of holds up the brand, supports the brand, and helps you drive that through um, the customer experience. And, and customer experience is a really key part um, of this journey because basically hotels are at, at its core is cost about customer experience. So making sure that those values align with who your target audience is and then how then you can amplify and drive that customer experience on a hotel level. Um, it's a very important part. And um, I was very lucky to be part of that process for, for, for some brands locally here. And, and, and the, the hard part is then you've got to live up to those brand values and live up to that expectations and continue to deliver. Because if you don't deliver and you, you promise something and you are, are not able to deliver, that's when you lose the customer. And that's where mm. it's lost. So it's a very important part, brand, hotel branding, putting that together. Um, and like I said, the visualization is just the, the final piece that kind of embeds the values with something that you create that can someone can resonate with. But the, the, the visualization piece is really not, the, not, not really the full picture. Gotcha, gotcha. And I guess that's, that's actually something I never considered before. I thought the, over, the vision would be it would start from the top and trickle its way down, but it turns out that it's actually the opposite. You have to build, build it up to get to that overall vision that you guys are trying to achieve, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You have to know what your brand values are and who you're targeting before you then start thinking about how you visualize that. But they need to come together. And that's why, you know, you've got some clever brand companies that kind of work with you on that to, to help you do that. So, yeah. Yeah. And I was actually reading um, an article yesterday about what are the main things hotels now are doing to um, like, what are the top five things they're doing now to, I guess, improve their uh, like their revenue and get more guests and so on. And one of them was um, they talked about technology and things like having a tablet in the room, you know, so the guests easy to access. And I've, I've stayed at hotels, so I, but when I'm doing it, I'm not, I'm not aware as a consumer of everything that they're doing. It's just, oh, when I get into the room, oh, there's an iPad. Okay, that's nice. But I don't, it doesn't, it doesn't, I haven't thought of it like they have. So, yeah. but one of the th main things they talked about was um, making sure it's customer led experiences now, making it as personable as possible. And in an industry where that is the main thing that you're trying to do, why do you think nowadays it's become even more important to be so customer led? Oh gosh, I mean, you know, hotels have mastered the basics, right? Of making a clean bed and, and providing food. But guests are now are looking for more than that. It goes well beyond that now. It goes into, they're demanding more. And I think certainly the, the Generation Z and generations that are coming up are demanding that that customer-led experience. Um, and it's kind of the, the emergence of, of customer data as well you know we we've always been about knowing the customer but now now we need to know the customer to such a degree that that helps and drives the customer experience as well you know knowing where someone has booked from um how they traveled here you know what what can we do if they traveled a long way a long um had a long flight away we know that when they get there they're going to be tired what can we do to make them feel comfortable should we give them a nice fresh juice when they check in should we make sure that their room is ready you know so it, it, hotels have mastered the clean bed situation and the basic. Now is the time of creating those experiences. Now is the time of using data 
and really leveraging on that data to drive elevated um, guest experience or, or, or customer experience. And it's an absolute necessity, uh, a necessity now, because if you don't do it, you're going to be left behind the curve. You know, you could have, you could have one hotel and two different customers and one, hotel, one, the, the, the two, one customer could go into the same hotel and have an amazing experience. And then the knock on effect of that is exponential life, you know, long time value of that customer, lifetime value of that customer, the word of mouth of that customer, the TripAdvisor review these days, and the same customer could go in the same hotel and not have a great experience. And the knock on effect of that is also really bad. So the customer experience is at the heart of what the hotel needs to offer. I don't think and no one expects to walk in a hotel these days and have an uncomfy, uncomfy bed or, or, you know, a lift that doesn't work. That's all, that's all, you know, they, we've mastered that. Now it's about how we are making sure that we are delivering that exemplary customer experience using data and embedding that data knowledge that we have from the data into the different verticals of the customer experience and how we can amplify that so that hotels can set themselves apart. Because like I said earlier, the minute you fail on that, the minute you fail on that, you've lost the customer. And in the world of digital where people were riding their experiences everywhere, you know, TripAdvisor, that's a big you know that's a big knock for the hotel and this is where loyalty starts from this is kind of where the, the emergence of what i do now and, and hospitality comes we can't create loyalty uh, in, a, in a in a hospitality environment if the customers had a bad experience they don't want to be sure. part of a loyalty program you have to start with that good experience and that's kind of why it's at the heart and the crux of uh, of what hotels need to deliver but but also I think customers are getting way more demanding than they ever have been before. And so the hotels have their work cut out for them. They, they, they really do. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I would I would 100% resonate with uh, that. Customers are demanding more. Because even myself as a consumer, I demand more. But this is one thing, um, and I, I think a lot of people would relate to this. I think in the UAE particularly, we are so spoiled. With, so the, with the quality and the level of service and amenities and all that kind of stuff. If you just drive down the road, there's like 20 hotels that you would happily stay at. And then I remember when I went to travel down the state in Europe, for example, like I'm paying the same price, but I'm not even getting one thing, 1% 1 as good as what I would get here. So yeah. it, it has spoiled us here. But so on that point, Dubai is, and the UAE is small, but the quality and the, the amount is super high. So how do you think that has affected tourism, the tourism aspect uh, in the UAE? Do you think that has had a big impact of people, you know, that are traveling in? Like, besides what Dubai and the UAE has to offer, it's like, oh, but even the hotels and the experience you're going to have is going to be fantastic. Yeah, naturally, that's that's going to support tourism. You know, the standard, the, the number of options, the quality. Um, but it's not just the hotels, like you say. It's, it's it's also the destination has so many experiences that you would struggle on a visit to be able to experience them all. You know, from ski slopes to rain, indoor rainforests, water parks, theme parks, malls. I mean, I have a list of things that I do with my kids. You know, I keep a list of all this cool stuff that comes up in Dubai and I put it on the fridge. And so and when we get to a weekend, I'm like, oh, let's go roller skating or let's go. And this list, I've never even got, you know, a quarter of the way through it. And I've been here 17 years, you know, yeah. there's so much. And I think the UAE has a lot to thank for its leaders, um, you know, really having that vision and to grow and develop the UAE in that way. And I think obviously, it's a very new country. We're celebrating our 50th um, anniversary uh, this year. And so with that comes the, 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 the growth of the, the economy, the growth of the country, new hotels, new propositions, this desire to be the best. Uh, it's all contributed to the, the, the interest of the UAE as a tourism destination. Um, never mind its geographical location, which is ideally situation between, situated between Europe and Asia as a stop-off point. Um, yeah. I think the UAE has su such great things that, um, at, you know, in its arsenal to support tourism. And I think that uh, with Expo and everything coming, I think I read something recently that said that the GD, the, 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 the amount of um, money that's going to going to um, support the GDP of the UAE by 2028, 2028, yeah, is about 280 billion dirhams. I mean, it's, it's, wow. it's a huge figure. Wow. Um, and so tourism is a big part of the GDP here. So, and I love the fact that we pioneer this space. You know, I love, I love the fact that tourism is such a high standard here. And that is half the reason I moved here. 
Um, because I was working in the UK and I was coming to the UAE with Marriott to look after some trade shows, the Arabian travel market, you might know of it. Yeah, yeah. Here with Marriott, we used to set up this big booth and all of our colleagues around the world would come in. And I saw um, Madinat Jumeirah being built and I watched it being built and I was like, wow, what an incredible hotel. Three hotels connected by these waterways. I mean, it's like Vegas. It's like another level. And that's what got me here is coming to visit like 20 years ago and seeing that growth and seeing how exciting it was that made me move here. And I moved here to work for Jamira. I saw Medina Jamira being built. And then I was like, I said, I want to work for Jamira. I see I saw Burj Al Arab. I saw Jamira Beach Hotel. I'm like, wow, this company, I've never seen anything like it. And mm -hmm. so I, you know, I focused on that and I, I actually ended up getting a job there, which was great. Um, so yeah, it absolutely impacts tourism. And I think that we're only going to go up and up and up as a destination. For sure. Um, and <clears throat> so I actually didn't, something I didn't think about, not just from a tourism perspective, people coming to visit, but like your story, there's probably hundreds of thousands of people who have a similar story to you who came, you know, from where, wherever they were in the world and saw, I guess, how things, how fast things were moving here and how yeah. innovative they were being. And here you are 20 years later. So I never thought about the, that that second level of like oh you could get people to come move here which also helps the economy which helps you know um it's like a snowball effect on on everything um and now with uh expo coming up uh, everyone's super excited of course and there's so much but I, I it was funny i was actually looking the other day i was just curious i'm like let me see what like the hotel prices are right now mm -hmm. and i i was shocked i remember i there was a hotel i stayed at um a year ago and the same one for the same room, which is not like a, it was a standard room, is now like it's like ten thousand for like two nights, and I'm like, what? Yeah. I could not be like I have no hotels jack up their prices, but this is something else. So I'm just like, how do you like? And when you got because I know hotels are like it's seasonal and kind of like airlines, you can, uh, prices can adjust from like one yeah, know, yeah. even an hour apart. Mm -hmm. So. How do you dis I know there's high season and there's like, you know, maybe down season and prices are affected. But how as from a hotel's perspective, how do they start thinking about when like how much can we charge? How much is it that when can we jack up the prices and buy how much for us to still be, you know, competitive? Oh, you're really getting into revenue management kind of um, skills here. And obviously revenue management plays a key part in the hotel kind of structure. Uh, I'm not a revenue management expert, but, but essentially what you're saying is right. So ho hotels will have, you know, low shoulder, high seasons. Hotels will have inbound markets um, where um, they'll have different rates coming from different markets into the into the UAE. Hotels will also have different segments. So there's different types of segments when you book, you can book through um, your booking direct whether you're booking through a travel agent or tour operator from England or Germany or China or wherever. Um, you've got your meetings and events business and you've got your um, groups booking. So you've got different segments, different markets and different seasons. And all of that put together, the revenue management team devise strategies to yield the best rates. Because at the end of the day, hotels are business, they need to be able to yield the best rate possible that they can achieve. And that's all done through certain technologies, through experience, through strategies. But absolutely, it, it, it is 100% a strategy. Um, and then fortunately, you will see hotel rates going up and down, supply and demand as well. And I'm sure you saw during the pandemic, a lot of the hotels in the UAE doing very affordable um, UAE resident rates. I think I yep. took advantage of most of those. Uh, but now, <laughs> most of those places that I stayed during last year I probably won't be able to afford to stay to stay in now but on the flip side of that I'm I'm really encouraged to see it because what that means is the hotel industry is coming back um it was really hard the time pandemic for the for the whole travel industry for many many different industries as well but hotels obviously took it very hard because people weren't traveling like airlines and so to see the hotels certainly in the UAE um picking up picking up rates bouncing back getting business from inbound markets I just think it's great to see, um, and, and but yes, you, you might struggle now to, to get the same rates you got last year. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. I remember we went to I think uh, the, our first like staycation that we did like a bunch of friends, and we got like two rooms for a thousand or something, and like everything included. Uh -huh. and we we're like, woo, yeah. And now, like, imagine you get you, there's no way you're gonna get anything near that. So that's so true. Um, and one thing I always think about when I'm staying at a hotel, and especially here because they're also like. They're not small, they're 
huge and they're beautifully designed and everything. I always, when I'm walking around, I'm like, how, like from a business perspective, I can't even imagine what the cost to build this was. Billions for sure. I'm like, how does, how do you get your money back? I'm like, how long did it take you to recoup that kind of investment? Because yeah. it's, and this like, not just building it and the, the amount of staff you need and the services and the bet, like everything. It must be such an expensive industry or business to run. Absolutely. And that's why the revenue management team need to yield rates to make sure they make budgets, right? So <laughs> there will be set budgets that need to be achieved in order to manage that, that, cap, that capex expenditure and then obviously managing the OPEX, the, the operational budget. So yeah, hotels aren't, aren't cheap. It's not, it's not a, a, um, a cheap thing to get into, you know, and, and, uh, and the way that hotels are structured, I think a lot of people don't, who are not in the industry or, or don't understand is that a lot of hotels are franchised or managed. So they might be owned by independent owners um, or companies that specialize in owning hotels, but those companies could own a Marriott, a Hilton, um, mm. Intercon. They can own um, different, lots of different hotels and have them branded. Most hotel companies are um, have a model where they don't typically own the hotels. It's it, there are there, somebody else, an independent owner, might own them, and then they're franchised or managed, and then in that becomes so the owners will will pay for the setup of the, the building and the, the construction of the hotels. And then different operators, like for example, Marriott might come in and manage uh, the hotel. And there's two different options in that. There's like, although now it's evolving into three different options, but there are franchise hotels where you, you take on the name of Marriott, but it's your staff in the hotel. So you're running it, but you're, you're taking on certain benefits from being under a Marriott name. And then there's manage where the, the hotel operator will completely manage the, the employment, the staff, everything in its entirety. Uh, and now we're starting to get into hybrids of the two now. Um, so the, the, structure, the financial structures of how hotels work and, and uh, management companies work is, is, is very different to what I think people think. When people go and stay in a hotel, I think they think Marriott own the hotel all the time, but it's not exactly. most, of the, most of the case. That, most of the time, sorry, that's not the case. Um, so it's a different, very uh, different kind of, background structure yeah yeah actually i for example there you go i never knew that i thought you know if i see an intercon i see a marriott i see a hayat whatever i'm like oh this is just another hayat owned hotel i didn't know that yeah. there was all these different types of ways that you could maybe just have the brand name or it could be managed by an independent owner yeah. or so on so no i had no i actually never knew that um yeah. and i think from a consumer perspective compared to if you're in the industry i think people see see it in very different ways so mm -hmm. what yeah. are i guess some of the misconceptions that us as consumers might have about the industry and then yeah. what are some of maybe the uh secrets that you might know that might help us consumers getting better <laughs> better rates oh okay interesting misconception so some of the misconceptions people think about hospitality is that it's very glamorous for the employees uh, working at hotels. They probably think that we have access to the swimming pools and we work in this lovely hotel and it's very glamorous. And yes, they are beautiful, but the hotel industry is very hard. You know, you work hard, um, you work long hours, you have to you have to love it to be in it because yeah. When you certainly if you're in an operational environment, you're in operational teams, if you're on the front desk or you're in restaurants, you know, you're on your feet all day, you're dealing with customers all day. Let's be face it, customers aren't always nice. Um, <laughs> <True. laughs> um so you, you have to deal with that, you have to deal with constant issues. Um, it looks glamorous, but it's really hard work. Um, really hard work. And so I think the misconceptions, often people think about this is glamorous, you know, five star hotels, it must be wonderful. And it is wonderful to have a great job if you love hospitality, but it is hard work. I mean, I think before opening a hotel, I, I did the opening for the Armani Hotel in Burj Khalifa. Okay. And I think there was even some days where it was like we worked 24 hours, you know, pre opening. Wow. When you, when you open a hotel and you've got to open the doors to the public and you've got, everything's got to be ready, you, you just have to, you know, get your hands dirty and get in. And I, I remember cleaning the kitchen in Armani Privé. I remember making flower bouquets for the opening. I remember delivering in-room directories to all the rooms. It doesn't matter who you are, what role you have. When you're opening a hotel, hands on deck, that hotel's got to open. And that's hard. You know, I did yeah. 18 days every day. So there isn't perhaps from the outside perspective, a view that working in the hotel industry is very glamorous. And at times it is, but also it's very, very hard work. Mm. 
that actually that's cra- that's crazy that you know to be I wouldn't I wouldn't have thought that you would have to be involved in so many things especially for you know as as you're opening the hotel I thought it would be very um was delegated but oh, I get it from the yeah yeah <laughs> and it is and it generally is but you know yeah. it's all hands on deck exactly. so you do and things come up that you don't expect I don't know like you know the menus don't arrive and they were supposed to have arrived a week ago and they've been shipped from I don't know um, India or somewhere and you need to so you need to improvise okay we don't have menus what do we do let's make some short term so there's constant um um innovation going on all hands on deck but to the public when the doors open it looks perfect and, and it is perfect because everyone's rallied around to do that and actually that's what I love about hotels and I love that camaraderie that you get from doing a hotel opening or, or working with your colleagues every day all day in a hard working environment you create this camaraderie that I've not I've not felt or seen um that kind of camaraderie outside of the, the hospitality industry it's so nice and I think everybody knows each other and, it, and it's very um you know if people move around different hotel groups you always know somebody at every hotel group if you've worked in hotels because everyone knows each other and you've shared that kind of experience with each other and it stays with you forever and like so and that's the kind of what I love uh, and especially when the company kind of leads from the top like in the Marriott example where you have someone passionate at the top driving this kind of this great morale and you know team spirit from the top down and it, it penetrates everybody and everyone's got this kind of you know support of each other so it, it, it's lovely actually um, in, in, the, in those kind of situations yeah no I can I can definitely understand especially like listening to your story about how long the days can be and how hard they can be and ev- and if you're in the industry it sounds like you need to be quite passionate about it to handle right. you know all all that kind of stuff and so i think you would get very close to people because you'd be like oh man remember that opening we yeah, picked this up and exactly. we threw this and yeah so i i totally understand that and yeah. uh, li- like you said you get to know everyone in the in the industry because i guess no matter what hotel opens there's going to be some common people around that you're gonna that you'd know so it also helps you i guess get a great network um in that field and Absolutely. um uh, coming back to the second part of the question, which was, so <laughs> when I work in hotels, because I think me and everyone else wants to know, uh, what are some of the tricks or secrets that you've learned being working on the other side that you c- you could share with us? Um, well, let me think about this. I was trying to avoid that question because I can't really think of anything. But, you know, I think from a rate perspective, um, yeah. most, most hotels now have this best rate guaranteed if you book direct. I think sometimes there's a misconception if you go via some of the other channels that you're going to get a better deal. But actually, more often than not, you'll get the best deal going direct um, because the hotels want to drive you to go directly with them because they don't have to pay commission or um, wholesale rates or discounted rates to third parties to sell their hotel room. They're trying to get you to book directly with them. And so what you'll find is that most hotels will have loyalty programs. If you sign up to the loyalty program, even if you think, oh, I don't know if I'll stay at Hilton again, um, you sign up, there'll often be loyalty, if you, and you sign in to the web browser as a loyalty customer, you'll see that you'll get probably loyalty member rates. Now I know most of the big hotel programs give a discount on the rate if you're a loyalty member. And so, I'm a member of pretty much every hotel program, not only am I in the industry and I'm in loyalty, but purely because you get the best rate. Um, And obviously, the more points that you get, um, then you can offset those points for upgrades and for other things that you need in the hotel. So so I definitely think that looking direct is a great option. Um, What was the other thing I thought of? Um, It's flown out of my head. Maybe it'll come back. But yeah, I I think definitely going directly to the hotel for good... Uh, for good rate is 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 the, is the right plan. Okay, that's really interesting because I guess well, my yeah. sorry, I came back. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, please. So the other thing is is that if you go and stay in a hotel and you want to eat in the hotel, um, often if you book a bed and breakfast rate and you go and sit in the restaurant and you eat, you'll pay the menu price in the restaurant. But very often, if you ask at front desk, do you have a half board rate if you buy it at front desk? And very often, it's cheaper. Than if you were to, buy, to pay for it out of the menu in the in the restaurant. So if the hotel has a half board option which you can buy at front desk, I would say buy it if you're planning on staying in the hotel because then you can go and eat in the restaurant, eat under the half board, but you've paid a set fee at the front desk, which is often less than you pay in the restaurant. 
Ah, okay. That's something I haven't heard of before. That's 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 brand new. <laughs> so guys, half board everywhere. Wherever you guys go, make sure <laughs> that's what you're asking for. And on the point about uh, booking direct, that's actually interesting because uh, when I've looked at, you know, compar- like 90% of the time, I think, I don't know about other people, but I think a lot of people use booking.com. Yeah. That's why I, that's probably the one I, I've used the most. And you seem to find, if, if I can remember, I was looking at one specifically, it was more expensive on the hotel side rather than booking. But I don't know if that I was taking into account the tax and that would make it maybe the same, the same price and like free uh, breakfast and all that kind of stuff. So um, it's interesting. I never thought that they would want you to come direct to them. I thought at the end of the day, as long as they're getting you as a customer, they're going to be, they're going to be happy. And of course they're happy and they have all these channels yeah. because all, all these channels combined create, you know, the, their revenue streams and they're all valid in their own right. Of course, sure. hotels with booking.com and, you know, special promotions all the time. But typically, generally, hotels would prefer you to come direct. Um, and in your when you say you, you might have got a net price without the tax and you go through to the end and you might find the price quite match. Or sometimes there are cases where hotels will have a special deal on booking.com and they don't replicate that on their own site. I mean... I, I don't know if that happens very often these days, but okay. uh, it could be smaller groups that haven't got that as a managed strategy. But typically, I think that hotels would want you to come directly. They want the relationship with you as well. They want the data about you um, because they want to be able to use that data to get you to come back. So definitely, there's an added value for getting you to come direct, not just the financial side of things, but also um, the data side of the- things. Yeah, absolutely. And you actually perfectly segued on to uh, my next question, which is all about data. And I know you love data because I listened to uh, your podcast with Paula and it was really interesting about listening to or learning about things like WhatsApp for business. And I, that's something I'd never heard of before. And I've also been working now with a, a marketing company to help me with my kind of stuff. And they told me like WhatsApp for business is huge. It's super important. So data is becoming, I know data is becoming even more important than probably it was before. And from the sounds of it, like you said, for hotels to develop that relationship, to understand who you are, to get you to come back, even for, to ca- for their revenue management as well, it's super important. But when it comes to, because I feel data has, there's, there's two ways to look at it. I think data is great because from it, you can, I guess, from a branding perspective or creative perspective, you can look at it and see what you want to create. But is there a time where, like on that data versus creativity debate, that it can become a hindrance to that because you're so focused on just like the numbers or that data and you lose that maybe the more free flow creativity that creates those beautiful, you know, experiences that uh, you're thinking of for your customers. What would you say? It's an interesting question. I mean, I think data is so important and it's essentially, it should support the creative development. It should support the creative output that comes out. They're synonymous. They work together. Um, And I I don't think you can have too much data. I think the problem, the problem is moreover, um, what you do with the data and how you use the data, and if you're if you're using it correctly. Um, I, I listened to a podcast not so long ago, and I used this lady's quote, so I must quote her. It was the lady that does the loyalty program for AC Roma, okay. and she did a podcast with Paula. And I listened to the podcast, and she said something very very interesting, and I've used it a few times. Um, People have data and people think that they use their data wisely and they say, well, oh, we know our customers, we've got data, we use it. But I don't think people really use it in the right ways. Um, she gave this example of um, Prince Charles and Ozzy Osbourne, you know, Ozzy Osbourne, the rock, the rock sure. star. Yeah. Okay. So you've got two gentlemen on paper and on your data sheet, born in the, they're the same age, they've, they're both ma- they've both been married, they both have two children, they both love music. Um, if they fill out preference, like some kind of preference questionnaire, what's your interest in music, you know, on paper, they could look like very similar um, human beings, but actually we know they're totally different. And so the top, the top level of data that we get and that people think that they can use to understand their customers often isn't enough. And I think that okay. we, need, we, we need to get a, a lot better at understanding people's preferences per, um, and personal data and actually really, really combining um, a, a, a different variety of data sets together to get a holistic view of the customer. 
And so only by really understanding your customer with a vast amount of data and putting it through algorithms and, and what have you to be able to understand that in, in, in an integral way, are you able to then create a, clear, a clearer picture? And from that clearer picture, you can then be then then say, okay, our customer is both Prince Charles and Ozzy Osbourne. How do we satisfy that creatively? Um, or is it not? Is our customer actually Ozzy Osbourne? Uh, in which case, how you're creatively, what the direction you go in is totally different. Um, and so data and creativity for me are synonymous. They must come together. Um, and I think as well, you know, companies in general and hotel companies really, really need to think, be thinking about how they build out their fir fir first party data. Because a lot of people, they get data, very kind of... Um, top level data. And then when it comes to marketing, they rely on using third parties from a digital perspective to send out digital campaigns to promote their services via digital platforms. Um, except with the changes that are happening with cookies, okay, they've extended the deadline, but they've, they're have they changing um, how data can be captured. And what's going to yeah. happen is, is you're not going to have the same um, level of third party data to send out your marketing to. So what companies should be doing right now before that cookie kind of um, rule change comes into place is, okay, how do we build out our first, first party data? How do we build in strategies into our business now to capture that data and the different types of data that we need to build out those holistic views of the customer and then use that to drive uh, every part of our business from the customer experience, but also to the creative development. Because, you know, you, you really, really, for me, creativity, really, you really need to know your customer. Yeah. Uh, you can't, you know, you can't just create, say, I don't know, I'll try and give an example, maybe your target audience is, maybe your target audience is Ozzy Osbourne and you create something very regal and, 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 and stuffy because you think your target audience is Prince Charles. So, but you're not resonating to who you're talking, who your audience really is. So data and creativity needs to be together. And I think that a lot of people have a lot of work to create that right marriage uh, and that balance. People need to use their data a little bit better. Um, so I don't think too much data is a problem. I think more data is good. Um, and people need to start building out their first party data. Yeah. And I think you made such an important point about the whole, um, the whole cookies aspect, because yeah. that I guess for so long has been the way that lots of companies get their data on their consumers. You know what I mean? Uh, it's very easy because there's so many links. So it's very easy to just push out yeah. a campaign if someone searches for something like that. But now it's a complete like mindset shift. You have to take kind of what they, the third party guys do, and apply it into your own business strategy and your own business development right. and from a creative side as well, like you were saying. And also something that was interesting was that you were saying that top level data is enough because I think that's what we typically assume data to be. It's like, oh, I have his name, his age, where's he from? Uh, one like very generic kind of things. So that is I, that would be considered in quotations like good data. But now listening to you that, oh, there's actually a deeper layer that you need to gather or understand for you to start targeting that specific that specific customer. Absolutely, and also driving that experience. I mean, I'll give you a good example. Um, I went for a meal at Atlantis a couple of weekends ago with my kids. It's like a celebration for the end of summer, or more like a celebration. They're going back to school. <laughs> um, so um, we went, and because I've been to Atlantis before. Uh, and I have an allergy to gluten, so I have a, a celiac disease and can't eat uh, flour or wheat products. Um, they had actually stored that piece of information about me in their CRM system. So even though I hadn't eaten there for a long time, I, I I'd stayed there and I ate at a restaurant maybe six months prior. I went to the hotel and when I walked into the restaurant, the first thing they said is, oh, Miss Lisa, we know that you've got a gluten allergy. We've spoken to the chef. Um, we've, we've prepared a whole bunch of options for you. So when you're ready, um, let's sit down and talk about what we can do for you. And they spent the whole meal coming to the table saying, you know, do you have everything you need? How was your gluten-free food? Da, 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 da. And I felt like a queen, you know, just from one extra piece of data that that they captured maybe from when I was in another restaurant and I told the waiter, that waiter went away, popped it in some centralized CRM system, tracked me as gluten-free. So every other booking that I've had now at that now going to Atlantis, I'm tracked there and I get this amazing service. How does that make me feel? That makes me feel emotionally connected to them. I feel like they're listening to my need. They understand who I am as a consumer and they've delivered that right the way through to my next experience. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're talking about. Gathering personal data, gathering preference data, 
I, I know that you know companies like EMA are doing this really well now where you know they've got great CRM systems and they're capturing preferences. So if I stay in a hotel and I and I request the lavender pillow or whatever it is that they have on the menu, next time I go, there'll be a request, would you like the lavender pillow again? So it's about capturing real, you know, personal uh, data yeah. and, and Customers are expecting that personal experience. You know, it's demanded now, especially in, in, in a five-star luxury hotel environment. If you're not providing it, I mean, what are you doing? You know, yeah. it's, it's expected. So, absolutely, it's not just that I'm, you know, I'm Lisa. I'm, you know, this age, and I'm, you know, tall, blonde, whatever it is that you can visually see, or I can type in a computer. It's about understanding me as a customer. Yeah, and uh, I think that's a great example you used. You know, it's something. Um, it sh that example shows that it's it's a small piece it's a small piece of data there's probably a lot more that they could know but for you that's a very important piece of data for them to know and for you so when you do go it shows them like you said that you, they i think it just shows them that you care and i think that's the most important thing that we care yeah. and we want because we care we want to give you the best experience which like you said creates that um uh, emotional connection so that's what it's all yeah. about yeah, and I'm going to go back now because of that. And it's not there that I'm someone that does that a lot, but, but they've now got another sale out of me. Exactly. Un unknowingly to me, before I turned up on that last couple of weekends ago, I'm now going back because now I'm going, oh, I'll go back there because I have that nice vibe about it. So it's well played to them. And, you know, yeah. congrats to them on, on doing that that way. Yeah, and like you said, they get another sale because now even for you, you become a... Uh, almost like a spokesperson for them like, okay. oh, actually you know like atlantis they actually i went and they didn't even know i, I didn't know they had that information they gave me all the stuff so now it there's a knock-on effect too uh towards all that and it's the goal of loyalty rights to create that yeah. advocacy that's the top kind of layer and so that's why i said to you before people think loyalty is like a loyalty program loyalty is not a loyalty program loyalty is a strategy and mm. that strategy starts with the customer experience no customer experience, you don't have any foundations to build loyalty from. And they've kind of, they amplified me from, from there to here as an advocate because of the way that they, they, they strategize their use of data. So they've created a loyal advocate of me, not through a loyalty program, but through the careful planning and, uh, of capturing data and using that strategically to make me have an emotional connection with them. And that's what loyalty is about, not about points and prizes. Yes, points and prizes and rewards come into it when you build a loyalty program, but that's not the reason. That, mm. and, and often it's quite frustrating when people come to us because we obviously do that as a business. So I want a loyalty program. And our question is, do you? What do you, what's, the, what's the objective? What are you trying to achieve? What, do you, what is it that you want to achieve? You might just yeah. need a strategy to get to that objective. And that strategy is different for everybody. That strategy doesn't need to be, you have to copy your neighbor and give points and give rewards and, and vouchers and whatever. It doesn't need to be that way. So, yeah. yeah. And that's actually a great, uh, great um, question to ask is, and something that I didn't even consider before. So like, when it comes to loyalty programs, it's not about, the what i'm giving the customer it's not that isn't the strategy isn't what i'm willing to give up for the customer like points or free yeah. rooms or free meals it's what's the connection or the emotional connection i want to create with this customer how do i want them to view me the rest is just the like the tools for example that i would use in that but that's not the actual end goal of what we're trying to do right. And coming back to uh, what you, your, your business uh, you talked about, because I remember the last time uh, we spoke, you were telling me the story of how you even got uh, started with your consultancy. Um, and what I loved about that story is it wasn't planned. And that's what I like. And, you know, you're now you have your own company and you're an entrepreneur and you have your own business. And it, sometimes I think nowadays everyone, lots of people, if they're trying to start a business or so on, sometimes it happens by accident and sometimes it, okay yes you're planning but i think your story shows that if you're if you love a field and you're passionate about it and you're you, you're talented in it then sometimes things are going to come up for you so if you don't mind could you just share that story with us of how the consultancy got started because i think it's super relevant to anyone trying to start a business oh thanks yeah I, i'm happy to and i think that making the decision to start a business is, is scary and running your own business is, is a tough thing. Um, and, and so my journey into it, it was very organic. Like you say, I had just had my my first child, my son, Joshua. So, sorry, uh, just that one second, I just need to plug this in. Sorry. Okay. 
Okay, I didn't want to. <laughs> the power was going to go. Yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Please go. No, no, no worries. Um, so I just had my son, um, Joshua, and uh, I'd obviously uh, I was uh, take take a little bit of time out to to have my child, uh, and I wanted to go back to work. So I wanted to go back to work. You know, um, I think it was about he was about eight months old or something like that, um, and I had this opportunity to go back to work for Marriott. As as you heard before, I, I have a real big connection with Marriott. So I was lucky to get a job there and I was really excited about it. Um, but the, the, the working mother um, life with going back, to, so the working mother life is hard. It's a real balance and a real struggle. And until you become a mother and until you try to go back to work after having a baby, you don't really anticipate it or understand it. There's, there's a pull and a guilt from both sides. So, you know, my one of my bosses was in, in Washington, in, D, in Washington, D.C., so he would come online at 7 p.m. And I'm on the phone talking to him every night with my headphones, trying to bath my son. Um, he's been at nursery all day because I've dropped him off at 8 o'clock and picked him up at 6. And then one hour he gets with mummy before he goes to bed. I'm on the call because my boss is in, in America. And so you have mummy guilt that you've, had, you've brought this child into this world, you want to work because it's your nature. You, 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 one, you need to, or two, you, you want to work. It's, it's part of who you are. But then you've, you, you're you not giving your time to this child that you really want to, to give time to. And then on the flip side, you've got guilt because you've got guilt with work, that you're not giving 110% mm. on the call because you're actually trying to bath your son at the same time. And so that Working mother guilt is a real thing. And, and I hadn't anticipated it. And, and from a mental health perspective, it really messed with me because sure. I, I'm i a perfectionist and I've worked really hard. I've worked in hospitality all my career. I work, you know, 16 hour days and I'm a workaholic. I love what I do to go from, oh God, I don't know how to, to give my best in what, how I usually do and then manage this little human that I brought into the world. And so after being at Marriott for six months and I'd had to travel a couple of times and that was also difficult with a, with a, with a small baby at home and you, you kind of feel guilty about leaving the baby. I, um, I decided that this wasn't for me and, and that I need to find an alternative path or alternative job that didn't require me to be working so late or um, require me to travel. And so I'd said to Marriott, I'm really sorry, uh, I've made a mistake and I need to choose my son um, and I need to find a different role that allows me to, to, to not have this guilt because it was mentally sure. quite, quite difficult for me. Um, and to cut a very long story short, but in the end, Marriott, uh, one of the departments within Marriott that I've been working with, we're like, well, listen, you know, okay, well, leave, but why don't you stay on as a consultant? We'll pay you as a consultant and um, just set up a, a license and we'll pay you as a consultant. This is what we'll pay you an hour and you can continue on this project um, and we'll pay you as a consultant. And I was like, wow, that's a thing. You can do that. <laughs> um, I was like, yeah, I never thought about that before. Sure. But like you say, that the fact that they wanted me to continue to work with them and the fact that they, they and then they told me the rate per hour and I was like, wow, I should have been a consultant ages ago, you know, like, you know, because consultant rates are different. So I was really happy that I had an alternative option. I could stay at home. I could pick up my son from nursery. I could work from home. I could go into the office when I needed. And they paid me on an hourly basis. It was like revolutionary. It was yeah. like, oh my God. So that's kind of how it started. So I, I have to give kudos to the guys at Marriott again for kind of, you know, being the support in my life or giving me um, something that, that shapes and directs the way that I've gone. And um but it just kind of grew from there and because in the hospitality industry is kind of the way it is and everybody knows each other before you knew it i was doing i did a project for atlantis i did a project for you know um marriott i did a project for raffles I did a project for fairmont i started to do projects for a lot of people that i knew that were working in the hotel environment and we, I, I think and then I, I took on an employee because i was like i can't manage the amount of work that's coming this is amazing so i took on an employee i started to build the employee kind of train um and then we just kind of realized we, we kind of spread ourselves too broad. I was a marketing consultant, but that's kind of like saying, you know, you're a consultant, you know, sure, yeah. you know marketing, anything. And there are 10 to the dozen marketing consultants out there. So unless somebody knows you and knows what you're capable of or knows your skill set, it's very hard to kind of build, carve out space. And so organically throughout the years, something that I'm very passionate about is loyalty. I worked in loyalty with Jamira. I, I started the, the loyalty strategy at EMAR. I'm really passionate about the use of data because um, I feel like that's where you can get really great tangible ROI as well. So I kind of 
funnel down what we were working on and really focused on that 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 sector because people have e-commerce pr marketing all these different departments within companies but they don't often invest heavily in the loyalty department unless they are a big program so sure. i really found that there was a niche there to support companies of all shapes and sizes with their loyalty strategy um, and and then we've really funneled and, and focused on that and um, built out our space in that. We're a boutique consulting company that works in that space. And we've been super lucky, you know, we worked, as you know, for Marriott for a few years, but we work with Etihad Airways, we work with um, some retail groups beside retail group, we've worked with some destinations, we've got a lot of exciting clients on the pipeline. And so I feel very blessed and very lucky that um, my journey has kind of guided me in this way. And, um, and that's kind of how it came to be, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that story. I love that story because it was, it like I was saying earlier, it came out of, it wasn't planned. It, you were looking for some flexibility and as a n new mother and to balance everything, it sounds like it was very, very, very challenging. And then because of the relationships you had, because of the work you'd done, they still wanted you to do yeah. that. And from that, and since you were already in the industry for quite a while, you had the connections and a network and I just built to where it is now and I think you made also a great point about being too broad and finding your almost your niche or what you enjoy the most which is for example yeah. data and loyalty so that's like a match made in heaven kind of thing um mm -hmm. so just yeah congratulations on all that I can imagine the journey to get here was uh, was not easy but uh here you are uh Lisa I want to be conscious of our time because I know you have a meeting to run off to soon so I've just got uh, two more questions for you um yeah. number one is looking back, I guess, either at your career or your personal life, what would you say you're most proud of for yourself? Oh, gosh. Uh, what am I most proud of? Um, you know, I think um, I've always been true to myself. Um, I think I have a really good moral compass. I, I always pride myself on being honest and true and hardworking. And I think that that it's easy to waver from that when people around you are not like that or you 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 you, you go and you have bad experiences but i've always tried to stay centered to, to who i am and i feel like because of that my path always goes in the right direction um and so i think i'm very proud of um that strength and that ability to kind of um keep centered and keep to who i am because i think that's important so less so less about jobs per se more so about how i feel about myself and my inner confidence because it has gone like this you know and i think working for yourself is also hard um you yeah. do go up and down especially in pandemics um so um yeah i'm, I'm proud of the centered um, self that i've created <laughs> yeah. no but uh, i think that's a great answer i like really like what you said that um you made a great point that it's very it can be very easy to waver especially if you're not you know the people around you or when things like pandemics happen like you you know like when all these un what's the word uh, non-stable i guess things or these surprises happen it's very easy to yeah. be swayed and affect you but to you know focus on just like stay who you are is this what i would do is this what makes me happy yeah. is this am i being true yeah. to myself i think is a great thing yeah. and it's not all and it's not easy to do sometimes as you know, it could be quite it could be quite challenging. Um, and for uh, my last question, uh, Lisa, what is the message you'd like everyone to take home with them today? Oh goodness, oh there's some toughies here. Um, what a message? From a personal perspective or a work perspective? I don't know. Let me think. Um, whatever, whatever get... you think is whatever you feel, whatever you feel. I think, okay, so from I'm going to do both then because okay. there's two, two things then. I guess connected to what I just said, I think, you know, advice I'd give people is to is to be true to themselves and to, to, to always try to do the right thing, be honest and have integrity because that has a really good standing. Um, and I think that builds, cultivates trust uh, and gives you opportunities in the future. You never know someone that might have worked for you um, before might end up being your boss. And, you know, you have to make sure that you're, uh, it's, it's a very small industry, it's a very small market. So be respectful, be nice, be kind, be honest and, and be true um, from a personal perspective. And from a work side, I think I'd love people to take away from this that, you know, um, people really need to start thinking about their data. 
you know we talked about hotels but a lot of that kind of centered back around to knowing your data everything that every everything from the customer experience to building the brand to the creativity to loyalty programs to everything it all centers around having a good data structure so from a work perspective i would encourage people to really think about that as core as core building out their first party data how they do that and how they use it they might even some companies might even have it but then they don't use it in the right way mm. and so from a business perspective yeah think about your data think about how that impacts your business um and then get that's some great advice and a great way to end the podcast i really like what you said about uh, on the personal side to you know be kind be compassionate it's a small like especially for in the uae that's it's not big it's small so you don't know in the future or but this can be applied to anywhere what the relationship you had with someone once upon a time in the future what that what that might become so just trying to be a i guess a good person be kind be compassionate is uh is always a good a good way to do good way to go forward and from a work perspective i think your message about data is so relevant and super important and i know lots of companies now i know data is a big thing but listening to our conversation today i think it needs to be there needs to be an even greater focus especially with the way things are going so i think that's some great advice uh lisa i want to say thank you so much for coming on the show this has been so much so much fun i really learned a lot from you about uh the hospitality industry and hotels and i'm going to use some of those tricks that you mentioned see what happens um and if uh anyone wants to connect with you lisa where can they find you how can they get in touch with you I'm on LinkedIn, so I love okay. connecting with people. So if people message me, I always reply. So um, LinkedIn is probably the best way. LinkedIn's the best way. All right, guys, uh, you heard it here. Uh, Lisa, thank you so much again for coming on the show. This is an absolute thank pleasure. Uh, guys, to everyone listening, thank you so much. Please follow the podcast and subscribe. You know, I'm all over the place, YouTube, Instagram, everything. And as always, guys, hope it helps. Peace. <laughs>